One of my favorite arcade games is Sinistar, released by Williams Electronics in 1983. I My original plan for this video was to briefly talk about ripping all of the sound effects from the game. But, as I learned more about the developmental history behind Sinistar, I was compelled to continue my reverse engineering research and go beyond my initial asset rip. Shortly after ripping the sounds, I found out that the source code for Sinistar was leaked in 2021, along with the code for several other classic Williams titles, including Defender, Robotron, and Joust. Unfortunately, the original assembly code to the Sinistar sound chip known as Video Sound ROM 9, was not included in the repository and has been lost to time. However, despite this setback, I was able to rewrite the source code for Video Sound ROM 9 by using the surviving sound code from the other games and a disassembly of the sound ROM itself as reference. In this video, we'll analyze the new source code and explain how the software uses the audio hardware to generate the various noises. We'll be listening to every sound in the game, including unused ones buried inside the ROM for the past 40 years. I'll also discuss how the cockpit cabinet version of Sinistar features one of the earliest implementations of true stereo sound in a video game, and why this historic audio innovation is still currently not supported accurately in MAME. Before getting into the really technical stuff, We'll start by taking a look at the story behind the shared sound hardware and software used in these Williams machines. To accompany the history lesson, excerpts from several archival interviews with the developers have been included. There's a lot to go through, so let's get started. Now, if you ever played some of these arcade games before, you probably notice they often share multiple sound effects with one another. During the development of Williams' first original video game, Defender, the hardware engineers decided to reuse a soundboard originally designed for pinball machines in their new video game cabinets. The board was given a model number, D8224. The additional daughter board used to make the Sinistar character speak has pinball origins as well, and was created in 1979 for Gorgar, the first commercial pinball machine with speech. When it came to creating the sound ROMs, the sound engineers decided to follow suit by reusing and modifying the same synthesizer code from game to game. The name Video Sound ROM was used to distinguish the video game sound chips from their pinball counterparts, which were labeled as Sound ROM, followed by a number. You can think of the Sound ROM as a collection of synthesizer routines or programs, each one responsible for generating a different type of noise. For the Music Gear fans out there, this is similar in concept to how the Arcturia Microfreak works with its multiple synthesizer engines. To trigger various noises during gameplay, the game CPU sends a signal containing the sound ID to the input pins on the soundboard. Because of hardware limitations at the time, the D8224 is monophonic, which means it can only play one sound at a time. So whenever a new input trigger is received, the CPU on the soundboard is interrupted and drops whatever it was doing before proceeding to play the new selected sound. With every new Williams machine came newer, more complex synthesizer techniques. And as the number of different synth routines grew, so did the collection of sound effects. As you'll see shortly, not one, but many people contributed to the code for these routines. In his only interview, Sinistar sound designer Mike Metz confirms the involvement of others when it came to creating sounds. This is what he said in 1983. Actually, Sinistar was just an extrapolation of techniques people at Williams have been using for a long time. All the tools I needed were basically here already. They already had a very good base of technical knowledge that Paul and other people here developed. 
The Paul that Mike is referring here is Paul DeSalt, who did speech processing work on Gorgar and would eventually become director of video engineering at Midway. Software engineer Randy Pfeiffer was the first to program the pinball soundboard, starting off with World Cup in 1978. The sound effects he created for the pinball machine Flash was groundbreaking stuff for the amusement industry at the time. It was the first to use a continuous background drone. During gameplay, the drone's frequency increases. Interestingly, one of the unused sounds from Sinistar is also a background drone similar to this one. Quick aside, Randy, along with his wife Sandy, will later go on to co-develop the cult classic arcade title Kix for Taito. When future Sinistar programmer Sam Dicker joined the Defender project six months into development, he implemented not only the explosion particle effects that the game is famous for, but also the sounds to go with them. Several filtered noise generators that Sam wrote were used to produce the explosions and various thrust noises needed for the game. While most well known for co-designing Defender, Robotron, Smash TV, Cruisin' USA, and many other arcade classics, Eugene Jarvis was also responsible for the synth routines in Gorgar and the 1980 pinball machine Firepower. Many of the new noises in both games were created using a wavetable synthesizer routine named G-Wave. Some sound effects made with G-Wave are so famous they have become synonymous with the arcade experience itself. Eugene had this to say about sound design. I was stunned to find out that the most brilliant sounds were often created by typing in random numbers for the parameters. Often incredible sounds were generated by inputting mathematically undefined values, such as echoing a sound zero times. The crudeness and lack of bounds checking of the program allowed for mathematical wraparound and error accumulation that sounded ethereal. In his interview with the Ted Dabney Experience podcast, Eugene recalls typing in random G-Wave parameter numbers with future Mystic Marathon creator Christina D'Onofrio. And I remember um, you just like people, somebody walked down the ha hallway and just like, okay, give me 10 numbers, you know? You know, they go, ah, 29, 36, 42, you know, like, and often, mostly the time that it would sound like shit, you know, it'd be like, Bleh, you know, but um, then so, I remember one time, uh, one, of, one of our uh, uh, female programmers came by, maybe, I guess our only female programmer, yeah. and she came by and she just said, zero, 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 and I go, that's, that's not going to work. That's bullshit. You know, that's, that's undefined. How could that work? Right. I typed it in. It was like the most coolest sound ever. <laughs> it was like... <laughs> You know, I think I, it was like, it was like, you know, like it was just something super cool. And it was like, wow, man. And uh, so, you know, you, so you had to really, it almost took a day like to get a really cool sound sometimes. Mm. Other people contributed their own synth presets as well. Pinball programmer Ed Suchaki created several G-Wave sounds for Firepower, two of which are immediately recognizable. <laughs> Ed Sound 17 is particularly memorable as the human pickup noise from Robotron. It's been used in nearly every Williams game in some fashion, including Sinistar. Mike Metz elaborates on how the sound effects for Sinistar were designed. What I did was sit down with the game designers and programmers who identified pieces of the game that would need sound things they like to stand out or give audio cues to. We sat down at a meeting and they said, we like it to sound like this, and then they made the sounds themselves with their mouths. We take our list of sounds and start programming. The programming consists of listening to sounds we already have and determining which ones sound similar enough to the ones I need to modify and which new sounds I'll need to create. According to project lead and AI programmer Noah Falstein, Mike allegedly took some unconventional steps to create some of the noises in Sinistar. For the extra ship sound, Mike used corrupted garbage data in his workstation's RAM to generate the unusual noise. I personally believe Mike also used corrupted data or randomly typed in numbers, like Eugene mentioned earlier, for the strange player start cue, my favorite sound effect in the game. 
Later in the video, we'll do some code archaeology and analyze the data Mike modified by comparing it with the corresponding unmodified data found in previous sound ROMs. Eugene Jarvis also created a parametrically driven pulse width modulation synth known in the source code as the variable duty cycle square wave routine, or very wave. This is another popular Williams synth known for its aggressive pulsing noises. Firepower would be the first machine to use the very wave routine, along with an improved final version of G Wave. The synth programs found in Firepower's sound ROM would go on to form the basis for audio at Williams throughout the 1980s. As a matter of fact, nearly all of Firepower's sound effects were repurposed for Defender. The recycling of audio assets soon became a signature trait for Williams Electronics. Even the game overcue heard in Sinistar would later appear in the extremely rare and bizarre title Splat. Conversely, the critical energy alarm heard in Blaster was originally created for Sinistar, but is never called by the game logic. It appears in Video Sound ROM 9 as one of several unused sound effects that can be triggered on the soundboard. Sinistar is not the only game to have a sound ROM with unused content. Pretty much every Williams game that I've gone through contains at least a couple of hidden noises that the game never plays. That being said, no other chip I've disassembled has more abandoned synth code than Video Sound ROM 9. It appears that the task of sound ROM development may have been handled completely separately from programming the game itself. Frustratingly, the sound ROM code is missing not just in the source code base for Sinistar, but for every other game that was leaked. Thankfully, the sound ROMs for Defender, Stargate, Robotron, and Joust were spared from being lost forever and have been preserved in a separate repository. I want to take this moment to thank Historical Source and everyone responsible for preserving and releasing this code. Without it, none of this work would have been possible. Why is it that the sound code was not included with the source code for Sinistar or any of the other games? I believe this is because the soundboard has its own Motorola 6800 CPU, while the game logic uses the slightly different but incompatible 6809. Giving the D8224 soundboard its own CPU and RAM allows it to function as a completely independent synthesizer device. This means that the soundboard can operate by itself without being connected to the game board. This makes it really easy to troubleshoot sound issues and do repairs on a workbench. Early pinball games also shared common sound ROMs with one another, proving how modular and swappable the sound code was from the game logic. In fact, you can put in a different sound chip from another D8224 and the game will still trigger sounds on it. Triggering sounds without the game CPU can be done by sending a binary signal directly to the input pins on the soundboard. This can be achieved either by poking the pins manually or connecting them to a switch that sends over the desired sound ID signal. In the case of Sinistar, only five of the eight pins on the board are connected. Five pins equals five bits, which means that we could trigger a total of 31 different sound IDs in Video Sound ROM 9. Before I knew about the Sinistar source code on GitHub, I was able to figure out how to rig my own sound tests in MAME by changing the game code responsible for playing the I Hunger voice clip every time a coin is inserted. However, I ran into a problem. The game logic uses a couple of important parameters for each sound call, including duration. Changing the sound ID wasn't enough as this duration value cuts off any sound longer than the original voice clip. Luckily, I stumbled upon a glitch by writing the sound ID in the wrong spot, which messed up the parsing of the sound call and prevented the duration byte from being written to memory. This allows us to hear the sound effect in its entirety. A couple of noises in the game heavily rely on the duration byte to control the length of the sound. The Sinistar piece added noise 
and the game over cue are interesting in that they both use the same sound ID but have different durations. The independent nature of both the sound ROM and its development led to the Sinistar sound code becoming lost. But because Video Sound ROM 9 is based off of previous source code that we now have access to, it should be much easier to disassemble the ROM and match up assembly instructions with the comments and labels from the source files. For new portions of code, I took the liberty of providing my own label names. Sinistar uses several different synth routines for its various sound effects. Some new programs were added, so to save room, the very wave routine does not appear in Video Sound ROM 9, which is also the case in the Sound ROM for Joust. These are the synths heard in Sinistar. An organ program, which can play back rudimentary music. It was utilized quite often in other games like Defender, Robotron, and Bubbles, but is only used in Sinistar when a warning message is displayed. The warning cue is the only music in the entire game and consists of three notes, an augmented G chord in the six octave to be exact. One of the more simpler routines is the filtered noise generator for the explosions heard in the game. There are three of them and each one is a variation of the canon routine found in video sound ROM 1. Both enemy and planetoid explosions use the exact same one heard in Defender. The player death explosion is actually two noise routines, both triggered sequentially. The second part of the bang uses the same cannon routine from Defender, but with a much longer duration. The initial impact of the player getting hit is the third cannon variant. This time, the length is set to a short value of 128, and randomization is turned off, creating a noise reminiscent of a gunshot. G-Wave has both the most used and unused presets in Video Sound ROM 9. 15 different sounds are defined in the code, while normally 10 of them can be heard in-game. In a few minutes, we'll take a closer look at the G-Wave routine itself to see how it works and listen to every single preset in the sound vector table. There is one more remaining synth routine that is used in the final game. It was originally created for Joust, and it is the most complex program found in any sound ROM so far. But we'll get back to this guy later in the video. Let's take a closer look at the large amount of unused synth code found in Sinistar. Four of these routines can be triggered by a sound ID, but the remaining ones are not connected to any input triggers, and therefore are truly abandoned synths. The first one is a noise generator that makes two different sounds. Neither of them don't really sound that great, and to be honest, I'm not exactly sure what they could have been used for. The other more interesting routine is the Flash-esque drone mentioned earlier. When triggered with sound ID number 5, the drone never stops and always plays in the background. It also never changes pitch unless you trigger the drone again. When the pitch does change, it seems to do so in a pseudo-random way. In order to turn off this synth, the signal for sound ID number 4 is triggered to disable it. This drone can add a nice effect during quiet parts of gameplay, though during tense moments the constant interruptions from other noises forces the drone to reset every time, which doesn't sound as good. The remaining six abandoned synth routines buried in the code seem to be related to tests or experiments. The only way to hear them is to force the input trigger code to point at the address for one of these programs. 
Some of them are carbon copies from previous games, like the insert coin sound from Defender. And here is a single oscillator siren sound based off of code from Robotron. These two noise routines have similarities to a noise generator program used for the deaf sound in Joust. Both of these routines use the sound ID itself as a seed for the random number generator. The very last two synth routines are alarms related to the diagnostic code for the sound ROM. Ironically, because the checksum byte found at the very beginning of the code is incorrect, the diagnostic test fails and this sound never plays. Here's what it sounds like if the test did work. And finally, here's a similar alternate noise that shares some of the same subroutines. Now that we got all the unused weird routines out of the way, let's turn our attention to the workhorse of the sound ROM, G-Wave. G-Wave is a parametrically driven wavetable synth, and with just 7 bytes, you can essentially create your own synth presets by defining several different aspects of the sound, from different waveforms to the number of echoes, etc. Three different tables are required to output sound. The wave table, the sound vector table, and the frequency pattern table. This synthesizer works by taking a predefined wave shape from the waveform table and applying the user-defined parameters described in the sound vector table to modulate the timbre. To control the pitch, yet another table is needed for frequency patterns. Two of the seven parameter bytes define the starting position and length of the frequency pattern. During playback, the audio changes pitch very quickly as it sweeps through the pattern data, while the other parameters tell G-Wave which parts of the timbre to modify as it plays. Some bytes tell the synth to transpose the overall pitch after every repeat, or apply LFO-like effects to the waveform. As I said earlier, I believe the player start cue was likely created either with corrupted data or just random numbers that Mike typed in. Like the clang sound effect used for the Sinistar piece, it is another sound that uses the duration value from the game logic to stop playback. If you were to trigger this sound without it, the entire start cue will play for nearly 11 minutes. Even when looking at other Sinistar G-Wave presets and their corresponding parameters, you can see how the player start cue sticks out due to the random values. The byte responsible for repeating the sound is set to B7 hex, an insanely high number. Instead of repeating twice, as heard in-game, the sound repeats 183 times. Let's take a listen to all 15 sounds described in the sound vector table. Here is the last routine in Video Sound ROM 9. Out of all of the other synths, this one took the longest to figure out. Earlier I mentioned that Joust and Sinistar share the most complex synthesizer found in any ROM so far. It's called the Walsh Function Sound Machine, which was used to make two famous sounds in Joust, the Ostrich Skid and the Pterodactyl Scream. In Sinistar, it's normally only used for one sound, the extra ship noise, which you may remember is the one that Mike modified with corrupted data. It's essentially an additive synthesizer that uses a series of square waves to produce different harmonics, resulting in complex waveforms. Walsh functions are named after mathematician Joseph L. Walsh, who first wrote about them in 1922. Instead of using Fourier functions with sine waves, the Walsh functions create a harmonic series of square waves, which are much easier to create digitally on an 8-bit CPU. Up to eight harmonics can be combined to make different sounds. 
The pterodactyl scream is the most complex sound created with the Walsh synth, as it uses all eight harmonics, while the ostrich skid uses just two. Because of the square waves, the output of the synth can be quite aggressive, which makes it a great choice for loud sounds. Programmers John Kotlerick and Tim Murphy were the ones who implemented Walsh functions into Joust. John initially stumbled upon a paper published in Computer Music Journal that gave him the idea. Tim wrote the routine code and then John designed the sounds using Wild E. Coyote and Roadrunner cartoons as reference for the skidding noises. At just over one kilobyte, the Walsh code takes up almost 30% of the Sinistar sound ROM. That's crazy to think about, especially considering that it's used so sparingly. While decent G-Wave sounds can be challenging to create at times, crafting cool new sounds for this synth is even more difficult. The Walsh routine requires both waveform and pitch programs to generate sound, and they are defined through hard to understand macros like this. Some instructions tell the Walsh synth which harmonics to use, and others tell the routine how to control the pitch of said harmonics. When building the ROM in an assembler, these macro instructions are converted into bytes that the Walsh routine parses to produce audio. Reading assembly is a cakewalk compared to deciphering these macros. Upon closer examination, there appears to be no corrupted data inside the waveform or pitch preset data. However, more further research is needed to see how the routine actually parses the programs. Instead, Mike Metz modified a table located between the main Walsh routine and the preset programs. This 18-byte section is labeled as the odd table and is used to define the waveforms for the eight harmonics created by the series of Walsh functions. Here is the odd table for Jouse. Since square waves can be easily defined in binary, each bit in the table represents a position on the waveform for that harmonic. One is up, zero is down. The bottom row is the fundamental or lowest frequency, with the rows above getting progressively higher in pitch. Now take a look at Sinistar's odd table. That definitely doesn't look right now, does it? At first glance, we can see signs of data corruption, but if we take a closer look, it's apparent that Mike may have manipulated the corrupted data afterwards to make it sound better. AAAA hex and 0FF0 hex are very interesting values because they don't appear to be random. 0FF0 hex is the lowest possible waveform that can be represented in bits and is also the fundamental frequency used in the Joust odd table. AAAA hex is the highest possible waveform in binary and it appears that the uncorrupted value is actually AA55 hex. Note that the bottom two harmonics in the Sinistar table are just different spellings of 0FF0 hex and produce the same bit pattern. Like the ostrich skid, the extra ship sound is made with two harmonics and use both 0FF0 hex and AAAA hex, thus making it an additive synth preset that uses the lowest and highest possible Walsh harmonics. Here's what happens when we replace the odd table with the original uncorrupted values from Joust. Mike's manipulation of the odd table appears to have influenced the other sound designers when they implemented the Walsh routine in later games. Splat and Mystic Marathon both share a new updated odd table, while Blaster uses the original table values from Joust. The Sinistar odd table is unique to this sound ROM. Immediately after the wave and pitch programs for the synth preset, we arrive at the Walsh table, which contains the pointers to those programs. This is where things get really cool because inside this table are unused sounds that are normally never called. Here are all of the synth presets that are in this table.
I think Mike was experimenting with different variations of the sound programs by trying out different waveforms with the same pitch pattern. Another preset plays a very basic single note with just one harmonic. It makes me wonder if this was used for debugging purposes, like listening to individual harmonics. Let's take a look at Interrupt Processing, which is the section of code that handles all the input triggers from the game and determines which sound to play. Here's how Interrupt Processing works. When the PIA controller on the soundboard receives an input trigger from the game to play a noise, it interrupts the sound CPU and gives it a value in the A register that ultimately becomes our sound ID. By comparing the A register with the number assigned to that sound, the code checks to see if the value matches or not. If it's a bigger number, we continue going down the list to check for the next sound. Otherwise, if the value matches, then we proceed with getting the synth routine started. Speech calls are handled slightly differently. After making sure we have the correct A register value, the program checks to see if the speech ROMs are present. Located at address EFFD hex is the start of our speech processing program. We check if the first byte of the speech code is valid by comparing it with a specific value. 7e hex. If the opcode matches with this value, then we have speech data, and the program proceeds to jump over to the speech ROM to start playback. But what happens if we disconnect the speech board? Well, something very interesting happens. To simulate this in MAME, we zero out the byte at EFFD hex and then insert a coin. Instead of silence, one of the G-Wave sounds previously thought to be unused is emitted. This noise replaces every line of Sinistar dialogue except for one. If the Sinistar roar is triggered, this sound plays instead. Hey, it's one of the Walsh synth presets. It actually does play in-game. Let's call this sound Air Roar, if you pardon the rather amusing pun. Here is the code that triggers the Sinistar roar and the extra ship noise. The extra ship sound ID is 3, and the roar ID is 2. Instead of going over to the new G-Wave air sound like the other speech calls, it branches off to the middle of the extra ship sound select routine. A sub A instruction tells the CPU to subtract the sound ID by 2. After subtraction, the A register value is used as the offset for the Walsh table mentioned earlier. Air roar is at offset 0, while the extra ship is at offset 1. Changing the number at address F0F1 hex allows us to listen to the other unused Walsh presets. All of the G-Wave sounds use one sound select routine, again using the A register as the table offset. This time, we're looking at the G-Wave sound vector table, where all the different synth presets are located. The code subtracts E hex, or 14 decimal, from any sound ID between the ranges of 16 through 18 and 20 through 28. Sound ID 19 is the Sinistar speech call for the beware coward phrase, but it may have been originally used for an alternate or earlier version of the bounce sound effect. The input trigger code for the dialog air sound loads a 1 into the A register to select the sound from the preset table, then proceeds to load G-Wave. Besides being one of the first games to have professional voice acting with lip sync, Sinistar's sound has important historical relevance because the sit-down cockpit cabinet features one of the earliest implementations of true stereo audio in a video game, beating Konami's Gyrus by a couple of months. The so-called stereo sound found in other earlier games like Gunfight and Omega Race often featured two or more speakers, but each one was usually dedicated to a player character or would only emit specific sounds. Here's another excerpt from the Mike Metz interview. The unique thing about Sinistar was the stereo programming in the sit-down version. There were two sound systems. In fact, there were two sound programs. One for the front two speakers, and one for the rear two speakers. It sounded like noise was coming from all sides. 
this really created the effect of actually being somewhere rather than having the sound simply thrown in your face by one speaker. It creates an environmental experience. Two soundboards were installed in the sit-down cabinet. The front soundboard is the exact same one found in the upright cabinet, complete with speech board and video sound ROM 9. The second soundboard is missing the speech hardware and uses a different sound chip, video sound ROM 10. Reportedly, only 200 cockpit cabinets were manufactured, thus making this ROM very hard to come by today. After missing for decades, it wasn't until March of this year that a dump of video sound ROM 10 was uploaded online. This explains why the stereo audio has been missing in MAME for so long. Video sound ROM 10 is very, very similar to its counterpart with only a couple of minor but important edits. In this ROM, all of the G-Wave sound effects are now slightly delayed by around 100 milliseconds. When played in unison with Video Sound ROM 9, the resulting output creates a stereo separation effect. This technique is also known as stereo widening and is a really easy way to simulate stereo audio with a mono sound. Unfortunately, this effect also introduces phasing issues when the left and right audio channels are mixed together on a single speaker, like a cell phone. Because of this, the game audio is best heard through headphones or by simulating the same speaker setup, which can be done by having the player sit in between two speakers pointed at them. You can even listen in a stationary car, which does a surprisingly decent job of recreating the pseudo surround sound vibe of the sit-down cabinet. In my source code recreation, I wrote conditional instructions that either insert or replace lines of code to build Video Sound ROM 10. Right before the section of code responsible for loading G-Wave sounds, three instructions were inserted. The first instruction loads 10 FF hex into the 16-bit X register. We then decrease X and then do it again, and again, and again until we finally reach zero. This loop happens over 4,300 times and essentially wastes CPU cycles to generate the roughly 100 millisecond gap of silence for the delay. Doing this has the side effect of accidentally muting the bounce sound effect in the rear speakers because of its brief duration. Again, there is no speech board connected to the rear sound board, presumably to save costs, so in Video Sound ROM 10, the interrupt processing code for the Sinistar air noise and the air roar have been replaced with an RTS instruction. This was done to prevent these air sounds from playing due to the missing speech board. And because air roar shares the same synth as the extra ship noise, it too gets disabled and is only heard in the front speakers. This means that the Walsh Function Sound Machine, the most complex and largest synth in any of these ROMs, is disabled in Video Sound ROM 10. Doing this makes nearly 30% of the ROM data go unused. The random number generators used for the explosion routines actually make these sounds perfect for stereo playback. The delay for the G-Wave sounds doesn't affect any of the other synth routines, so the fireball blasts play at the exact same time on both soundboards. After a few moments of gameplay, the random numbers start to differ between the two sound ROMs, creating a slightly different noise for each audio channel. The results are truly immersive explosions that, in my opinion, sound more impressive than the original mono audio. Mike Metz's laissez-faire approach to developing software is evident all over these two sound ROMs. I'm rather fascinated by how much sound code was left abandoned and haphazardly put together. Noah Falstein's story on how the extra ship sound came to be provides some insight into Mike's alleged methods. This is how Noah tells it. They had a very dumb microprocessor that handled the sound 
and Mike had to program different values into its RAM to make it come up with different things. One day, he realized that when he powered up his system in the morning, there was random garbage in the RAM, and it could make really odd sounds, although most of them were just annoying clicks and buzzes. So, he started turning it off, turning it on, and playing the sound, and if it was interesting, he saved the RAM data. That's how he got the extra ship sound that is my favorite in the game. Very clear and strange. But after an hour or two, his development system stopped working, and when he told a hardware tech what he'd been doing, the tech almost had a fit. Apparently, repeatedly flipping it on and off was the worst thing you could do to it, and he burnt it out. With Video Sound ROM 10 finally dumped, and the source code rebuilt, I wondered if it was possible to figure out how to get the stereo sound emulated in MAME. 2023 marks the 40th anniversary of the game's release in arcades, so I figured it was important to get this project finished before the end of the year. After the sit-down version of Sinistar was released in March 1983, the two soundboard setup would appear again later that same year with Blaster, but this time it was installed in the upright cabinet for regular stereo audio with no weird speaker placement. Even though I barely know anything about C++, I glanced at the main driver code that made Blaster's stereo audio work and retrofitted it to work with Sinistar. I really couldn't believe that I was actually able to get it to work. I submitted my code to be included in MAME. Even though it works, the code needed some cleaning up to follow the stringent standards set by the MAME dev team. One of the devs took it upon themselves to rewrite my code and commit it to MAME, which at first I was very happy to see. Unfortunately, there's a huge problem. When I looked at the code, there were questionable changes that I was not expecting. I was shocked to hear how terrible the audio sounded. Also, my original source code comments about stereo separation were edited to say reverberation instead. There is absolutely no reverb or effects processing involved at all with this sound system. This was not how my code was supposed to be implemented. So what gives? Because MAME has been in development since 1997, several portions of the code base need major overhauls, especially the code responsible for routing audio. Even though my code worked and sounded completely fine with the audio routed to the left and right speakers, this is technically incorrect since the cockpit speaker placement is front and rear. The Williams engineers basically faked surround sound by taking two stereo speakers and having them literally surrounding and pointing at the player. This is akin to rotating your headphones sideways. But this is not how the speakers have been routed in MAME. Instead of left and right, it's front center and rear center. This results in totally inaccurate audio that ruins the intentions of the developers. All the sounds are now doubled, and the explosions are distorting now because the stereo audio has been mixed down to mono. In order to get the code to work as intended, two lines need to be uncommented in the Williams driver source code, and then process that through a compiler to generate a custom build of MAME. Obviously, this is not as easy as simply launching the app. I already submitted a new request to fix this oversight, but in the meantime, I have included a link in the description to a Windows executable for those who want to experience the proper audio without waiting for compiling times. Hey everyone, here's a quick update on MAME. So after I recorded all the narration for the video, I noticed that my new pull requests that I previously mentioned hadn't been looked at or commented by anyone. I decided to reach out to the people in charge of MAME via their Shoutbox chat room. After pleading my case to them and letting them know how much I worked on this and that the intent of my code had been completely ruined by this choice, their response was verbally harassing me. Another person in chat, Hayes, stood up for me and offered what I thought was a very reasonable workaround. This was R. Belmont's response. Hayes has been contributing code to MAME for over two decades, 
and seeing how rude they were to a fellow senior contributor underlined the toxic attitude of the current main dev team. So much for posting respectful and insightful comments. Despite other chat members agreeing with me and Hayes, the MAME maintainers refuse to accept that this should be the default way of handling the audio. MAME should be able to support people who don't have surround sound setups and have just two speakers, like me. More importantly, if I were to build my own sit-down cabinet with a MAME machine, my audio routing has no issues and allows the implementation to be a drop-in replacement for the original gear. With Vast's code, this is not possible because all speakers are playing the same audio. This whole situation feels completely unnecessary, and it has negatively impacted my mental health. It hurts to see all my hard work get misrepresented like this, and to see others treated in a similar fashion. Regardless, I'm thankful that the framework for stereo audio has been committed to MAME and that all that needs to be done is uncommoning two lines of code to get it to work. But until these two lines of code are uncommoned, the Sinistar stereo audio will never be accurate in MAME. I feel that MAME has a very important mission in making sure that software from the past is properly and accurately preserved. This is not an easy task and requires the thankless efforts of a large group of people. But if MAME's mission is to strive for accuracy, then we must make sure it's actually accurate. Here are my closing thoughts. This whole experience has been an exceptionally long journey for me since I first started playing Sinistar back in 2005. I already knew about a couple of unused sound effects and the corrupted data story, as well as rumors of stereo audio for nearly 20 years. It wasn't until now, after doing all my research, that I finally experienced them in an emulator and with such clarity. As a self-taught programmer, I never thought I would go beyond just ripping assets and be capable of doing things like contributing code to MAME itself. It brings me great pleasure to be able to preserve and document this important video game audio milestone. I want to thank several people whose work was instrumental in helping me understand and properly document this data. Kaputnik Go's preliminary disassembly of Video Sound ROM 9 was an extremely valuable resource, especially in times when I was in uncharted code with no symbols or defined variables to go off of. I also had my Eureka moment that led me to Mike Metz's corrupted data thanks to their work. Be sure to check out their website for music made with these soundboards and further Williams Sound ROM information. I also want to mention Rob Hogan aka M Wedge for giving me the inspiration to attempt rewriting Video Sound ROM 9's source code after seeing him successfully build Defender's Sound ROM with the assembler Vasim. His slightly rewritten code helped me at times when I was really stuck. Daniel Lopez made an incredible JavaScript app called Defender Sound Studio that both emulates and equips all the synths in Video Sound ROM 1 with a graphical interface that makes editing sounds a breeze. This online app helped me understand how G-Wave and all these other routines actually work and with it, I can create and audition new sounds that can be used for mods to Sinistar or nearly any other Williams game. I wish I knew what happened to Mike Metz after he worked on Sinistar. I'm not sure if he contributed to any other games, nor have I found any way to contact him or even verify if he's even still alive. This is one of the reasons why it's so important to preserve this early video game history before it becomes lost forever. I will end with an excerpt from the same article that features Mike's interview and the game's audio. So, Sinistar now stands in the arcade, a proud achievement in both sight and sound. A proud achievement that may very well be drowned out by the cacophony of other arcade machines. Only in the sit-down or cockpit model, or when the machine stands alone in non-arcade surroundings, can the player truly savor the effect. Now, anyone can experience this immersive effect after 40 years of virtual silence. 
This is Cinemax. Thanks for watching. <laughs>